Welcome to Citizens Insight, the Citizens Party's interview series on matters of national and international importance. Today, nobody is safe in the financial system unless the government writes this wrong. My guest today is Peter Johnson of the Association of Independently Owned Financial Professionals. Welcome, Peter. Good evening, Robbie. What we're, t what we're going to talk about is a, a sort of a tip of the iceberg, or, 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 the, or not the tip of the iceberg, the, the part of the iceberg that's underneath the waterline of a financial crisis in Australia that is huge, most people aren't aware of. And it's the fact that since 2008, 200,000 Australians have lost $40 billion in financial disasters that most of which shouldn't have been allowed to happen. Sometimes there's some things are unavoidable, but we're talking about particular schemes that should have been policed much better. Um, Peter, your organisation has identified this list. <coughs> I've, got it, I've got it here. It's the list of failed and frozen funds since 2008. And we want to talk about that list and the consequences what the, or the implications of what this means for the financial system and how we can, what we can do about it. So before we begin though, just um, uh, for the sake of the audience, just introduce yourself. What is the Association of Independently Owned Financial Professionals and how does it differ from organisations like the Financial Planners Association? Okay, well we, we established in 1998 and um, we're a formal association, um, a not-for-profit. And we cater for all, all, all our members of the independently owned or independent advisors around Australia. There's about 5,000 of them. Um, these people operate their own AFSL, their own licence, and also they right. uh, do not have any ownership from financial institutions. So we act in their best interest, which is different from other associations who are funded by the banks, and therefore they act in the bank's best interest. Um, and, but we don't do that. We operate in, in, in our members' best interest and also the, member, the clients of the members. Yep. So we look after the consumer, we, we look after the advisor. And therefore there's not a conflict of interest between your members and the institutions that they advise their clients to put to invest money in? No, no. For, uh, the advice process is, quite, is, is, is around getting research and uh, what, what we have with, with each one of these, these uh, failures over, over the years, they've, they've, there's been actually a positive research rating, which shows another flaw in the system, the fact that product, man product manufacturers shouldn't be allowed to go to a research house and pay to get rated because it's, conf it's a conflict. Yeah, yeah. Now, every one of these um, 150 odd funds in here had a positive research rating, which they paid for. Right. So there, there is a massive conflict. Yeah. Okay. And and um, but by that virtue of that alone, your your members are trying to run their own small business as financial advisors. They they don't have the resources to go and do all the research themselves into the, into these. So they rely on those ratings, don't they? Of course. Yeah. And and if there's a conflict, then it can lead people down the garden path. So, all right, let's look at the list because I just I'll, I'll highlight some of the um, the names. I, I, we'll publish this list, and we might even scroll it up on the screen for the sake of um, uh, uh, the viewers. We want people to recognise themselves in this list. If you are a victim of these companies, this discussion is relevant to you. It's relevant to the whole country, but it's especially relevant to you. So you're talking about, um, you know, uh, ANZ's on here, AMP's on here, the funds that they've managed, Trio Capital's on here. Um, Australian Unity's on here, uh, Bankers Trust, Challenger, uh, Deutsche Asset Management, Great Southern Agribusiness is the biggest one actually on this particular list. Storm Financial um, is on this list and of course that involved not just the Storm Commonwealth but Bank, the Commonwealth yeah. Bank and uh, Bank of Queensland etc. Um, uh, Sandhurst is on this list, MLC, Opus Prime, Opus, um, there's a whole, whole bunch of them. Now, the, the, you, you said the overall list is over 100, mm -hmm. right? But this particular list adds up to 40 losses of $40 billion that Australians, that's rightfully the, the, the um, should be in the pockets of 200,000 Australians that they have lost or can't get access to because of the disasters that these particular investments proved to be. So when we saw this, this was, um, this was reported in the Australian Financial Review uh, last Tuesday, yes. right? 
uh, the 16th of November, and that's why I gave you a call and said, mm -hmm. and, we, and we caught up. Um, it, to us, we had been looking at the Sterling First case, which is one collapse of a, one scheme, in Western, mainly in Western Australia, uh, $18 million in losses and borne by 140 elderly people, right? Yeah. And we've looked at that in great detail, a lot of, you know, that's, that's shocking in its own right. We saw this list and we thought, oh my God, that really is the tip of a huge iceberg, yep. right? So this is a huge problem in Australia. Um, what responsibility uh, does the regulator, ASIC, have for this problem? Well, we think it's a fairly significant one um, because ASIC approve or register these funds to go on the market. Now, I'm sure every person, every consumer thinks that ASIC will have a close look at these funds, mm. but they don't. As long as they qualify in five different tick the boxes, like uh, does have a trustee, custodian, etc., they don't look at the directors, so you could have Ronald Biggs on there and, yep. and they don't even look at it. They don't look at the business model to see whether it's sustainable or not. They just say, oh, they've, they've ticked the box on five occasions, let's put it on the market and caveat emptor, buyer beware. So there's poor old mum and dad who, who, who have got this, what's called a PDS, a product disclosure statement, which is yeah. like a prospectus, yeah. which they've got to go through and it's like 150 pages of just gob gobbledygook and they're expected to then make a decision on that. Now, one of the biggest threats going forward is the fact that dodgy brothers can go into ASIC, get a scheme put together, as long as it satisfies those five tick yeah. the boxes, then it's available, then they can go on the internet and get directly to consumers. Mm. And that's dangerous. And dodgy brothers would know it's that easy to register with ASIC. Yes, it is. It's this, this, is, this is the problem. ASIC got caught up in a, in a major problem back in the 90s of where they were sued because they allowed this prospectus on the market, which is, which, which is what termed today a PDS. And this was a time when they did regulate products? Yes, yes, they did. And, and they had a closer look at products back then. Yeah. And then they got sued and they said, right, we're no longer doing this. We'll just register them and let mum and dad work it out. And we're saying, well, that's not, a regulator's meant to be, meant to be there to protect the yeah, public, yeah, yeah. not after the fact and come and clean up the mess once, once people have made, made mistakes. They should be there looking at these products because I'm sure mum and dad would have thought that because the government's given us a tick, they've looked at things which, which, yeah. are, quite, which, which are quite fundamental, like who are the directors? What about the business model? Yeah. Is, is it sustainable? And that's what's obviously happened with Sterling First. And that's what, happened, that's what happens with, uh, with all these products here. That, well, that is the assumption. The regulator has signed off on something, therefore it must be okay. That, that is the thought process. Yep. And, and, and ASIC say, no, we don't take any responsibility. But they don't say that. No. They don't say that because if they did, everyone, everyone would be up in arms. Well, they say it at the inquiry yeah. after the event. Yeah, that's right. That's, when the thing's blown up, yep. which is the wrong way to do it. To me, to me you've, you've got to be in there early, straight away say, no, that's not good enough. It doesn't go to market. And yeah, that's Pete, what mum and dad, I think, believe. Do you, you, would, you probably wouldn't remember this, so you don't have to um, scratch, uh, you know, rack your brains for it, but I imagine when ASIC got sued in the 90s over one mistake mm -hmm. um, and had to pay out some money to some victims, um, it would not have added up to $40 billion <laughs> that it's... That, They've, it's taken this approach since then. Oh, so it's told us to avoid that happening again. The government having to pay out money. We will have a system where we're not responsible for anything. The consumer ends up paying the equivalent of a $40 billion fine. Yeah. How, where's the balance in that? Well, there's not. It's just ridiculous. And I'm sure if everyone understood that, all the consumers, they'd say, well, this is not good enough. Yep. They put pressure on their local politician. What ASIC should do as, as, as a bare minimum before this product goes to market, they should have a panel of research people from Mercer, Morningstar, etc., yep. sitting there, and these people look at it and go, one star, or this, yeah, or five stars. Yeah, yeah. At least it gives some indication that yeah. mum, mum and dad say, oh, it's only got one star, I'm not touching it. Yeah. Or it's got five stars, it's good. But they don't want to do it. We've been pushing this for years, but they just don't want to do it because I don't know why, but it just seems the most obvious thing to do, get a third party to say, is, is this good or bad or is it all right? Well, I'll give you an example of, the, of how the checklist worked in relation to Sterling First. So the, the mastermind of the Sterling, Sterling First scheme is a gentleman named Ray Jones. And 
He was discharged from bankruptcy in 2015, the year the scheme started, right? And he was well known to ASIC going back to the 1990s, early 1990s. He'd, he'd incurred um, uh, massive losses for investors before. So um, in the product disclosure statement, such as it was, his name's on it. Mm. However, uh, in the paperwork that ASIC got applying for the financial services license, his name wasn't on that. His son Ryan Jones' name was on that. And ASIC said in its submission to this inquiry that they, they held hearings for last week, well, we had no grounds to deny them a license because his name wasn't on it, mm. right? As if they couldn't just do some basic checking Research, and all yeah, that sort yeah. of thing. And if the people, uh, I interviewed on this show, Beryl Taylor, one of the victims, and she, she recounted how when her and her husband sat down and signed all these reams of paperwork, which they thought was a lot because they were signing up to a rent for life scheme in advance, so they had to break up 40 years of of uh, tenancy agreements into five-year lots. And so they had to sign, 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 sign. When they finished, and they, and they were signing with Ray, Ryan Jones, the son, when they finished and uh, were leaving the room, they shook hands with Ray Jones, who came and introduced himself, and congratulated them on this great investment they'd made. And I said to Beryl, if you had have known that he had been discharged from bankruptcy that year, <laughs> would you have signed up? Hell no, yeah, right? No. And this is... So and here's, the, here's an issue with caveat emptor, uh, Peter. It says, let the buyer beware. How can the buyer beware if ASIC doesn't provide them that information? Absolutely. It's, it's just, it's just, yep. it's stupid. And um, they just turn up, they just won't do anything about it. So we know who has suffered from caveat emptor. Who, in your view, has benefited? Who's benefited? Well, um, a whole pile of dodgy brothers out there who've, who've, have made profits on, on on these funds, especially with the with the with the uh, with the management fees and stuff. Um, yeah, look, it's uh, the the big loser are other consumers, and these are the people who ASIC should be protected. And, Do you think the uh, banks have benefited? Oh, there is no doubt. Look, look, look the, this the, this is why the banks have got out of financial advice because uh, because they expect to make huge margins on it, yeah. and and all those margins have been squeezed. Plus, they got embarrassed out over the fee for no service. Issues of, yeah, yeah. of the Royal Commission, so so yes, look, the banks have made billions and billions of dollars of it because those margins are now thinner. They're now saying, well, we've been embarrassed, we're we're kind of getting out of it. But but what they're going for is robo advice, okay, which is a conflicted computer software system telling you to leave your money in the bank, and that's that's where they want to go because they don't want to have responsibility of trying to of trying to run uh, an advice business. And they clearly don't like you guys. No, no, well, because we, look, we just tell it as we see it. Mm. And if we get it wrong, we get it wrong. But I don't think we've got it wrong in this case. And uh, uh, we just think people should know. We and haven't, and haven't in um, numerous inquiries, um, the, hasn't the conclusion been, it, you know, where the assumption was it was the financial planner's fault. Oh, yes. As an inquiry, they realise it's not the financial planner's fault. It's the product and the bank's Oh, absolutely. Advisors have, have, have been the scapegoats over the years. Now, we advisors, we are consumers too, right? If, yeah. if these are products, we're consumers. We expect ASIC to do the right thing and the product and the bank and the product manufacturers or the bankers to do the right thing. They manage the products. ASIC let them on the market. And us advisors, it's a bit like, it's like we're, the, you know, we're the camera shop. We've got all these products there, released on the market by the government, made by the manufacturers, and we... We dispense product, yep. but you don't blame us if it blows up. Yeah, if, if you poison it, if you get poisoned, it's the manufacturer's fault. Of course, and the and government regulator for letting it happen. Yeah, absolutely. But but they've they've so conveniently blamed the advisors over the years, and mm. we've we've copped all the flack, and it's been so unfair. But now the best thing about this this compensation scheme, which is being debated at the moment, is it's now separating advice and product. And people say, hell, it's not the advisors, it's the banks, yep. it's the institutions, it's ASIC. That's why these things are failing. And, and um, in 2018, uh, we reported something you said then, which was in relation to the Royal Commission, you identified this, speci this specific structure of the banks, which is what caused this conflict of interest called vertical integration. Mm. How did that affect their products? Oh, well, vertical integration is just code for having in-house advisors selling in-house products. Yep. It's called a fancy term, vertical in integration. And it's just a totally conflicted way of doing things. But, it, and it should be banned, and it hasn't been because the banks have too much power. 
as you'll see, as you've seen with these with his donations, they've put up forty to eighty million dollars over the years just to kind of get their own way with the politicians. So therefore, their their integration was 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 tolerated with. Mm. But now, 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 now it's out of favour. Now, yeah, so after the Royal Commission, a lot of banks started spinning off their advisory businesses yep. and, and their financial planning businesses, etc., because it did look bad. Mm -hmm. But we put up a bill that Bob Catter introduced into Parliament and then One Nation reintroduced it for Glass-Steagall. Break them up. Do not allow banks that have deposits to have any other businesses, mm. right? There must be a separation so there's no conflict of interest. And, of course, Jane Hume... The Minister for Financial Services now, who we'll talk about more in a minute, she ran the inquiry as the as the chair of the um, the Senate Economics Legislation Committee to, that completely squashed mm. any idea that would go in that direction, of right? Course. Because they so yeah, the banks the banks um, did a few things to look better, but that was to make sure they didn't get forced to do it through legislation. Anyway, um, I want to <laughs> I want to remind you in 2014. Uh, Greg Medcraft, who was then the chair of ASIC, he said in a, in a Senate inquiry, he acknowledged that he said Australia was a paradise for white collar criminals. But fundamentally, that, 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 that was a, quite an admission, but isn't mm. that ASIC's fault? Well, it's a politician's fault, right? Because right. the politicians should be giving ASIC instructions. So ASIC are in a kind of a, you know, a, in a hard place in in one respect, because they get the rules. They're the kind of the policemen, right? Yeah. So the police to make the rules, even though ASIC do kind of slant them some way to, to suit, suit themselves, of course. But yeah. Ultimately, yeah, you're right. Yeah, ultimately, it's the politicians who should be doing this. Um, it, it's like Chapter 7 of the Corporations Act, which is just an absolute joke. And it's totally in favour of the banks over, over consumers, mm. and um, and there's currently kind of a review on it at the moment, and we we we, we hope they're going to totally revamp it. Uh, but you've got all the banks behind the scenes saying, well, we don't want this to happen. It's going to make it's going to make us accountable and responsible. So we can't have this happening. So, well, let's so there's all this politics. Well, let's talk then about what you uh, you have identified your organisation. You've done this analysis of of. Um, uh, political donations to the major parties, especially the Liberal Party. Who who are the biggest donors in Australia? Oh, it's the it's the financial institutions. Uh, I think it's Westpac Bank. It's going to be about nineteen million dollars they've given across. Um, there's about we've 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 identified, and it's on an, uh, on a website called Democracy for Sale. Uh, which is all sourced from the Australian Electoral Commission, so so it's all there. Right? We'll put the link on below. Yeah, yeah, and um, and and uh, the bottom line is there's about there's about forty four billion, uh, sorry million, uh, which has gone across to to to, to the banks over the last probably ten years, and no, um, no, no, I, sorry, it, um, since two thousand and four. Oh, yeah, forty four million dollars the oh, banks yeah. have paid to the Liberal Party. Yeah. They've actually paid more. They, they donate to the Labor Party as well, and, and, but not as much. Mm -hmm. Just from the banks to the Liberal Party, yeah. since 2004, $44 million. $44 million, yeah. And I, think that's, I think that's more than double the next biggest contributor, which is yeah. the property sector. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it's all... And if... Um, what I understand the way it works, also, they only have to declare 50% of their donation. So that could be easily $80 million. You, know, you just don't know because it's very opaque... Oh, well, we're, something... a we're a political party. Let me tell you how it works. I saw it in the list you provided. They, um, the Liberal Party of Australia has a federal branch. They have seven state branches, mm -hmm. and they're all separate entities. Yeah. And they can take one donation and split it up okay. among all those sections and only have, have to declare the minimum. Yeah. Right? This is, this is the way all this stuff is covered up all the time. Yeah, yeah. It's... It's ridiculous, and uh, it's about time the citizens of Australia kicked up a fuss about this. I agree, and we, and we put pressure on the on the politicians to change it. Well, let's talk about that now, because in terms of doing something about it, the government has announced this compensation scheme of last resort. Now, so um, just start from scratch. How is that supposed to work, and what's the problem with the design they've come up with? Well, it was um, it was it, 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 it's a great idea. It was it was recommended by Kenneth Hayne in the in the Royal Commission, and he wanted it to start on the one one two thousand eight, 
and then so all losses from then yeah all, all losses from then and cover all investment products which okay? is which is this list all, all this stuff right? 40 billion dollars no. that that's what it was, that was what it was meant to cover but because obviously the groups on this list don't want to see that happen no. because I don't I don't give that money back you know yeah. so they so they've been fighting it and you can see why these donations have gone into the Liberal Party because now you've got the politicians saying, well, what they, what they want to do now is start at the point of legislation. In other words, you know, it could have been last night. Um, and then, but also exclude MIS, which is Managed Investment Schemes, which is what all these are, yeah. including the selling first thing. Yeah. So there's nothing really left. So it, it, it's a Clayton's compensation scheme, the, the way they want it. Because they're trying to protect the institutions who don't want to pay up, and, and this they've, is they've capped, they've capped the uh, the individual payout to something like 120 grand, and they've capped the volume of payout the scheme can to a few hundred million a year. Yeah, yeah. Right. Whereas we're talking about a 40 billion dollar problem, mm. and they've got put these crazy caps on it. Yeah. And 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 excluding MISs, which is what this is all about, which means sterling first people will not get compensated. Because it's really just a Clayton's compensation scheme the way they want to do it. And let me go on a rant about that. Sorry, Peter, but because sure. we're right in the middle of this sterling first thing. When, when, um, uh, when ASIC chairman Joe Longo was at this hearing last week, he was asked to apologise to the sterling victims with the Bennett because he'd been so sincere in his expressions of sympathy, right? And so Jordan Steelejohn said to him, would you take the opportunity now with the benefit of hindsight to offer an apology? And he point blank refused. Mm. And then he doubled down and insisted on calling them investors mm. when they didn't know they were investors. Mm. You know, technically they were, they didn't know that. But by insisting they are, he knew he's denying them compensation under this scheme, the way it's structured, mm. right? Yep. So it's completely unconscionable. We have to um, overhaul it. Now, there is a campaign to overhaul it. And... Um, I know Choice is involved, uh, you guys are involved. We absolutely support the necessity to overhaul it. Mm -hmm. What's the pathway by which it's been identified this compensation can be paid out? Well, well we, think, we think it should be firstly from 1-1-2008, yep. which is what Hayne wanted. We're just suggesting what Hayne want, wanted is what's put in place. Nothing more, nothing less. And didn't the politicians all line up to promise they would do that? They did. They had both sides of politics say that we will implement Im, uh, implement um, Haynes' rec recommendations, which is great. Well, here's, here's the uh, the Treasurer, Josh yep. Frydenberg's document from February 2019, which is the same month as he as he took Haynes' report, Yep. but had that rather awkward exchange with him where Haynes wouldn't February say the 3rd. February the 3rd, February the 3rd it was. And the headline here is Restoring Trust in Australia's Financial System, the Government Response to the Royal Commission uh, into Misconduct in Banking, Superannuation, and Financial Services uh, Industry. And on page, now everyone remembers, they said, we're going to implement Hain in full. And so you've identified here in this bullet point, point on page um, five, five uh, we will further improve consumer and small business access to redress, i.e. compensation, um, by going beyond the Royal Commission's recommendations by, quote, expanding the remit of AFCA, the Australian Financial Complaints Authority, which is, they're the people who sort of look at each yep. case and say, yeah, that needs compensation, um, for a period of 12 months to accept applications for disputes dating back to 1 January 2008. Yep. Now, if they, they've already essentially... Well, they committed the way, to it. They committed to it. But with the way they've designed the CSLR, they've already dropped that. Yes, well, they are trying to exclude MIS and start it from the point of yep. legislation. So all these people, including Sterling First, will not get compensated. And it's wrong. It is just wrong. And they're going against what they said they're doing, also what Hain wants to happen. So am I right that um, uh, Choice and others have identified 10 corporations, large, 10 of the biggest financial institutions, that they say should be held responsible for these losses? Yes, yes, they have. Um, and um, we agree with it because they've made billions and billions of dollars out of the f out of these yep. failures over uh, over the last twenty years, and we think they should pay up. We we want we want mum and dad to get their money back. It's going to help help them with their retirement. Yep. Also, for all, for all the kids out there with the parents who've caught up this stuff, it's yep. more inheritance for them. <laughs> well, everyone cares about that, I guess, at some point. So yeah, it's it's only fair and reasonable that these people get their money back. And the government's committed to it, and now they're trying to back out of it. 
Now, I, what, what I would add to that as the, our party's perspective is they should identify these 10 top financial institutions, go on for all their worth and get the money, but, um, and there's justice in that, right? Mm -hmm. But the more important, justice, deni uh, was it justice delayed is justice denied. What's more important is to get the compensation flowing as soon as possible. And if that means the government has to front up this money first, and a portion of it permanently, they should do that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Pay Which these people they out. Do. Yeah. Yeah. Which is what they said they'd do. Um, I mean, if Josh Frydenberg can write off $11 billion through the, through the job keeper, keeper, why don't we get that back off all the companies who have profited from it and put, exactly. put that on the table? No, exactly. Um, now, the major parties, uh, as we said, they all promised they would implement these recommendations from Hain and Full. How do you have any sense how Hain would feel about what the government's doing now? Well, I think he'd be disappointed. In fact, I, I've been um, um, kind of communicating with him via, via, via email, and uh, he doesn't say too much because he's got to be careful about it. But you can just get the sense that he's disappointed, right? He said, "Well, look at my report. This is what I want to see happen. Yep. If the government chooses to change it, well, that's up to them." It's up to the government. But however. We had both the both sides of politics commit to implementing these recommendations, yeah. and that's 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 the opposite of what Jane Hume's trying to do here. She's trying to change it against Hume's recommendations, also against what 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 her treasurer said in 2019. They're going to do this, and, and they're trying to back out of it. Well, well this is this is the, the 23rd of November. Yesterday, the 22nd of November, Jane Hume addressed the Financial Review's superannuation shindy. And she reiterated, no, we're not going to expand the compensation scheme of last resort. So here's the, here's the, um, the bottom line here. We need to get this message out to all those victims, all 200,000 victims, plus their extended families who, yep. you know, I'll, I'll give you an example. I, I interviewed a, a bank victim here um, uh, a few months ago. And you real, uh, it, it really brought home to me, it never is just the victim, just the, the name of the husband and wife mm. or, the, or the one person on the, on, the, um, on the contract who lost all the money. Their, their families all mm. feel the pain that they go through. Mm. These are devastating losses. It, tra it changes people's lives um, for the worse. Always there's suicides that, that, yeah. that happen. The, nothing like a financial crisis to trigger a suicide, in fact, mm -hmm. right, where people can be left devastated. So there's lots and lots of victims out there. We know there's 200,000 victims of these that have borne these $40 billion in losses. We need to get the message out to them and get them involved in the campaign to force the government to expand the CSLR the way it should. What is that campaign that they can support? Well, we've put one together ourselves for, for, for our members. Where we're going, we're going to the to their local member, um, a federal member, and just make them be aware that if if things don't change, yep. we'll put them last on the ballot on the ballot list. Now's the time to hit these politicians yep. because they don't listen any other time. But now their necks on the block, their jobs on the line. Now's the time to pressure them. Now, all these victims, they should write to their local their local sitting member, whether it's Labor or Liberal, it doesn't matter. Write to them. And just say, look, we expect this to be to be honoured, which is what Friday being said he'd do, yep. and hold him to account for it. And just let them know that if, if it's if it, if it's not honoured, then you may vote a different way. Because they're all singing for their supper now, all the politics are starting, and now's the time to hit them between the eyes. And can I say, I my assessment is um, again having come at it from the from having uh, helped with the Sterling First campaign. Those, victim, those Sterling First victims have been languishing there for, for um, two years. They, they were, I mean, they've fought really hard and admirably, and they've been led really well by um, Denise Braley from the Banking and Financial Finance Consumer Support Association. But um, the system was geared to ignore them. We, 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 start, we looked at their case. We got involved in their campaign. That led to, a, to media coverage. It led to a, um, the current inquiry that's underway now. The hearings last week were absolutely dynamic, right? If enough people paid attention, they would be shocked. They, they, you would see ASIC for what it actually is. Mm. That was all on display last week in the hearings. We're going to produce a video that, that illustrates that. But it shows you that when you put the effort in to a weak point in the system, you can, you can um, bring pressure to bear and start uh, 
pushing this issue forward, yep. right? So what we've been doing overlaps what Choice has been doing in this area of expand the CSLR, what you guys have been doing in this area. I think there's never been a better chance to actually win this. So mm -hmm. if you're a victim out there, of you know, you're one of the people who's borne these $200,000 in losses, you should actually get a little bit of hope. We could win mm -hmm. and get the compensation paid, right? But it's gonna require you to get involved. And the other thing I'd appeal to people, and you can comment on this if you want, Peter, but the, um, think about the bigger picture as well. If we can force the government to, to actually address this, I don't see how the government can address compensation on this scale without then having to own up to the fact that, as you said, they, the politicians, are the ones that have kept ASIC weak and ineffective. Mm -hmm. And therefore, ASIC must be overhauled. It mm -hmm. must go back to pre the Wallace inquiry 1998, go back to um, properly being a real tough cop on the beat, yep. right? Um, and uh, uh, as, as uh, the, the previous head of enforcement, Daniel Crennan, who was kicked out last year over this unjust um, expenses scandal said, the banks should fear us. Mm. And I knew as soon as he said that, he would be a target of the banks. Because mm. the banks, no, no, the bank's attitude is, no, no, we don't fear, we, we do not want a system of regulation where we fear the regulator, right? So we have to go back to forcing the um, banks to fear the regulators. We've got to make the regulator tough. And the government will only do that if it's forced to pony up and it's get, get its buddies to pony, in the banks to pony up the $40 billion that they owe the, these losses. Do you agree with that? Oh, of course, yeah. Look, look, <coughs> look, ASIC's got to be proactive about stopping people losing their money. It's no use coming in after, after it's done and try and recoup the money. It's far better if they're proactive. They put in place procedures which they look at the products before they go to market. They get a third party to say that's good, that's bad, that's whatever. And then mum and dad have a chance to know yeah. whether they invest or not. And this includes us, us advisors too. Because we rely on ASIC, yeah. we rely on the product manufacturers to do the right thing. But it's all been turned around on us over years, saying, hang on, this is great, this is cut, up. We're, we're here, they're there. They should take responsibility. Yeah, oh, and, exactly. Uh, all right, well, Peter, thank you very much. This has been very enlightening. I hope the uh, viewers have learned a lot. Um, please, this is one video you should, you should share and share widely. We need to find those 200,000 victims. We need people uh, whose names are on, who are victims of the companies on this list, get, seek out this campaign. Pay attention to what the Citizens Party does because we're, we're gonna make this very, very prominent um, because you're right, this is the, the, the time before an election where the parties are susceptible to being influenced in oh, the right way, absolutely. They should be, there should be a bidding war between the two major parties over who's going to compensate the victims first. That's what <laughs> yes. we have to change here. Oh, ab right? Absolutely. And um, this campaign can do it. So And lead to a proper overhaul of the system so we don't have this kind of problem again. Otherwise, you aren't safe. You, the consumer, are not safe in this financial system. There's paradise for white-collar criminals if we don't make these changes. So, Peter, thanks for joining the no us Thank on you. Citizens Insight. Thanks to the viewer for tuning in and get involved.